Can increasingly antagonistic relations between the United States and China be reset? In private talks have been happening but behind rather the scenes between the two countries and there are reports Secretary of State Antony Blinken could be traveling to Beijing in the near future. But publicly, tensions are growing. Just over a week ago, a Chinese warship sailed dangerously close to a U.S. military ship in the Taiwan Strait, a move the Americans condemned and China defended. There's also a new report from the Wall Street Journal that China is building a station in Cuba to spy on the U.S. The Pentagon is dismissing that story, while China is calling it slander. John Kirby is the National Security Council's spokesperson. Hi, Mr. Kirby. Good to meet you and good to have you on our program. Thanks very much for having me. This week, when you were speaking, following what happened in the Taiwan Strait, you said it indicated a growing level of aggressiveness on China's part. At the same time, your administration, your colleague Jake Sullivan, in fact, also said the U.S. wants to reset relations with China through diplomacy. Why do you want more diplomacy with a more aggressive China? Precisely because things uh, are getting uh, more aggressive in places in the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait, uh, it's when things are like that, when the tensions are that high, that mis miscalculations, misunderstandings can lead to somebody getting hurt. So it's particularly because things are so tense in the relationship that we want to make sure we're engaging in diplomacy and dialogue and see if we can't bring those tensions down. It's awful hard to, to, to get uh, tensions reduced uh, and to get understanding increased when you're not talking to one another, particularly in the military or military lane. And that's the channel that has been cut off. Do, do you think it is likely that someone will get hurt? It's possible. I mean, certainly nobody wants to see that happen. Uh, but when you have a, a Chinese warship uh, transiting in front of a U.S. warship at about 150 yards. And trust me, I've stood on many a deck of many a warship, and that's pretty close. Um, or when you have a, a, a Chinese fighter jet uh, forcing one of our uh, aircraft to fly through its, its jet wash, that's also an indication of how close those two air aircraft were uh, in international airspace. There's a lot of chance for people to get, to get hurt, and nobody wants to see it uh, devolve into that kind of confrontation. The devolution of the relationship between the U.S. and China, but also Canada and China, is is really our, our viewers are really familiar with that. We've of course felt it very in close proximity in this country, vis-a-vis -vis the two Michaels who were of course detained for for so long. What are the prospects based on how the relationship has devolved? Do you think for diplomacy to actually improve the relationship? The president is optimistic that we will be able to get this relationship back into uh, what we're referring to as the spirit of Bali when he and President Xi had a three hour plus meeting uh, during the G20. Uh, and both uh, leaders agreed that, that, they, that we both need to responsibly manage this uh, relationship. It's one of the most consequential bilateral relationships in the world. Uh, and as President Biden has talked about it. It's a strategic competition, a competition that he believes the United States is well poised to succeed in. But we've got to we've got to keep the lines of communication open. So uh, the president's optimistic that we're going to get there. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get Secretary Blinken back over to Beijing in the not too distant future. And that can be followed by other uh, senior administration officials uh, travel to, to China as well uh, to, to talk to them on a spate of other issues that are not necessarily security related. So there's there's opportunity here and we want to take advantage of it. When you use the term optimistic, has China given your administration any reason to be optimistic? And if so, what? Well, so, I mean, the fact that we're talking to them about a potential visit by the Secretary of State is a positive thing. The fact that we're talking to them about uh, the potential visit of, of, uh, of other senior level administration officials, that's a positive thing. I mean, the lines of communication remain open. They're not open in the military lane, and that's one of the things that Secretary Blinken wants to fix. Uh, but they are open elsewhere. And, and so the fact that there is dialogue, uh, again, gives us a, uh, uh, an opportunity here that we want to take advantage. Is there trust? Does the U.S. trust China? It's not about trust. I mean, look, there's um, lots of issues where we don't see eye to eye with, with uh, China. You mentioned tensions in the Taiwan Strait, South China Sea, the way they're militarizing uh, outposts throughout the South and East China Sea, uh, their unfair trade practices. You saw coming out of the G7, uh, all the G7 leaders issued a very strong communique uh, on staying united on on some of the things that China's doing, including, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, whether outbound investments need to be uh, further uh, further restricted and uh, and taken a look at. So there's, it's not about trusting. It's about being pragmatic. It's about seeing the, the China challenge for what it is, but also seeing the possibility for opportunity 
opportunity. There's going to be things where we can and should work with China on, uh, such, such as climate change, and we want to be able to pursue that as well. Am I to infer from that that you don't think trust is necessary in order to reset the relationship? What we think is necessary is clear-eyed, pragmatic diplomacy and the ability to communicate with the Chinese on many different levels uh, about all these different issues. Will that diplomacy, do you anticipate, reach the highest level? And by that, I mean, I, I heard you talk about Secretary Blinken, other uh, secretaries or other high-level officials. Eventually, do you anticipate President Biden and President Xi will meet? I definitely believe that, uh, that they will have another conversation. Now, whether it's a face-to-face -face meeting, the next iteration, I just don't know. Uh, but the president has said he's looking forward to speaking with President Xi again at the appropriate time. And, uh, and when that is, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it then. I wanted Mr. Kirby also to ask you about Canada's potential role in all this, and, and specifically as it relates to the AUKUS pact, so the security pact between the U.S., the U.K., and Australia. Uh, I know it's primarily ad uh, aimed at addressing threats in the Indo-Pacific, so for example, China. Uh, was Canada ever invited to be a part of the pact as it stands now? This is an arrangement, as you said, rightly, between Australia, the uh, United Kingdom and the United States, and that's where it is right now. And uh, it's not an alliance and it's, it's, it's not some sort of club. Um, it is three countries that have uh, experience in nuclear propelled submarines. Uh, to help Australia develop that kind of capability. And it's important to remember uh, that this is really targeted on nuclear propulsion for submarines right now. Now, could it expand to other capabilities? Uh, we're just not there yet. Right now, we're focused on making sure Australia gets these uh, a nuclear powered submarine uh, capability. And what that gives you, uh, as an old Navy man, I can tell you, I mean, what that gives you is uh, it gives you greater range. Uh, and it gives you greater stealth uh, because the nuclear power submarines can stay underwater and stay deployed for a much longer period of time. So I have kind of two follow-ups to that. The first is you said we're not there yet on, the, on what else it could be. Do you, right. do you have any anticipation or, or any timeline of when you might be? Because from the conversations here in Canada, that's where Canada potentially could fit in. So I think our viewers are interested if they could fit in, if we could fit in, at what point? Yeah, I just don't have anything to say on that in terms of what the AUKUS could look like going forward. Again, we, we're, we're really tailoring it towards this nuclear-propelled uh, submarine capability. But look, we obviously recognize, and you heard President Biden say this when we uh, visited Canada not long ago, standing up there with Prime Minister Trudeau. I mean, we know Canada is an Indo-Pacific power uh, and has been for uh, its existence. And, and we know that uh, Canada, the Canadian Navy in particular, is very active in um, in Indo-Pacific security uh, affairs, uh, because you guys have national security interests there as well. We we work very well with uh, Canadian armed forces, not just through NORAD, but also at sea in, in the Pacific, and we expect that that will continue. I, I think people are kind of looking at AUKUS the wrong way. It's, it's not... It's not an alliance. It's not intended to be. Um, it's intended to be a consortium to help uh, Australia develop this particular military capability. If it isn't all that, but let's say then in the future, has the U.S. ruled out other countries like Canada joining the consortium? We, we don't, uh, again, we're, we're, we're simply focused on making sure that they can get nuclear-powered submarines. That's, that's where AUKUS is, is focused on. And there really aren't discussions right now or plans uh, to, to modify the AUKUS arrangement uh, in the future. Again, I, I can't be perfectly predictive of where things are going in the Indo-Pacific, uh, but, uh, but that's what this is focused on, and that's, and that's where our heads are right now. But we're very grateful, of course, as I said, for all of Canada's contributions in the Indo-Pacific, which are significant. And of course, we have all kinds of other arrangements with Canada from a military to military perspective, including NORAD, uh, that will obviously continue. Uh, Mr. Kirby, just before I let you go, I have one more question for you, and that's on, on a separate issue, if you don't mind. President Trump, uh, former President Trump, now faces federal charges, which accuse him of mishandling classified documents he kept when he left office and then obstructing the government's efforts to reclaim them. Some Republicans, including the Speaker of the House, accuse your administration of, quote, weaponizing the DOJ against President Biden's main rival. They bring up the fact that President Biden had classified documents in his possession as well to underscore their accusation. Your response to that? I simply am not in a position to comment on that here from the National Security Council. That's beyond my purview, and, and I, wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't deign to comment on something like that. Okay, understood. Mr. Kirby, I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. You bet.